So welcome to all of you. Um, as many of you know, my name is Gabriel Rosenberg. Um, I'm Associate Professor of Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies, or GSF, um, and History here at Duke University. I chair the Sexuality Studies Advisory Board, uh, and I'm also the Director of Graduate Studies. It is my honor to introduce Professor Lynn Puffer, who will be giving this year's career theory lecture to honor Eve Sedgwick. Um, before I, I say more about Professor Puffer's work, I do want to say a little bit more about this event um, to contextualize it and give us a sense of what we're doing here. <coughs> so you are joining us for our annual career theory lecture in honor of Eve Sedgwick. Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies hosts this annual event to welcome, celebrate, and think alongside individuals we consider to be the most incisive and provocative scholars in the interdisciplinary field of queer theory. Um, and to do so to honor, in particular, one of its most incisive and provocative critics, that being Eve Sedgwick. As many of you probably know, Sedgwick spent much of her career here at Duke in the Department of English, where she authored field-defining works of queer literary criticism, including Epistemology of the Closet in 1990 and Tendencies in 1993. Although she moved to the City University of New York in 1997, where she taught until her passing in 2009, she left an indelible mark on this community here at Duke um, and in North Carolina as well. In particular, Cedric worked, um, Cedric's work helped to establish Duke as an intellectual leader in the critical study of sexuality. Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies hosts this event every year and has done so um, for more than a decade now as both a tribute to Cedric and to continue her legacy. The lecture asks leading scholars to not only showcase new research, but ideally to also offer broader perspectives on the state of the field, its past, and its future trajectories, as well as to tease those boundaries, setting new itineraries, engaging new audiences, and perhaps fostering new queer publics. In this sense, we sometimes ask, perhaps too insistently, not only what queer theory is, but what it might yet become. More broadly, the Centric Lecture is the centerpiece of Sexuality Studies programming at Duke, that programming covers lectures, workshops, film screenings, and other events, and also supports an undergraduate minor in sexuality studies in GSF, um, as well as content related to the GSF Feminist Studies Certificate. All of this activity is oriented towards charting the centrality of sex, sexual identity, and sex practices to contemporary political uh, and cultural formations in the United States and around the world. And I am thrilled that sexuality study enjoys a close relationship with Duke's Sally Bingham Center, for Women's History and Culture at the Rubenstein Library. Um, I think it's important to note that that center now houses the Eve Kosofsky Center of Papers and archive that as of this spring, pardon me, as of last spring, is now open for research. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Hal Sedgwick, uh, whose generous support allows us to record and digitally archive this lecture. And now to the matter at hand. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Lynn Huffer. She is a Samuel Candler Dobbs Professor of Philosophy at Emory University. She previously taught at Yale and Rice prior to arriving at Emory. She's held numerous fellowships, including one most recently from the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Um, I'm not going to list the entirety of things that she's published, because we would be here all evening, and I would rather hear Professor Huffer herself, so I will summarize, uh, or, or at least um, make things a little bit more uh, concise, by talking about uh, the five books that she has authored, beginning with important works in feminist theory in Another Colette, The Question of Gendered Writing from the University of Michigan Press in 1992, and Maternal Past, Feminist Futures, Nostalgia, Ethics, and the Question of Difference from Stanford University Press in 1998. However, starting with Matt for Foucault, Rethinking the Foundations of Queer Theory from Columbia University Press in 2010, and continuing through Are the Lips a Grave, a Queer Feminist on the Ethics of Sex, also from Columbia, and Foucault's Strange Eros, also from Columbia um, in 2020. The Foucault Trilogy, as I believe it's called, um, has been published exclusively with Columbia University Press, which is a great credit to them. Uh, in these works, Huffer has focused on thinking with the provocations of Michel Foucault, and particularly how his thought has been both formative for contemporary queer and feminist theoretics. And Huffer's readings of Foucault, I think, are original, deft, and incisive. 
They resituate Foucault's textual corpus in ways that challenge conventional formulations of his influence on queer theory um, and potential uh, genealogies for both feminist and queer theoretic modes. Um, in particular, Mad for Foucault uh, forces us to rethink um, Foucault's early texts on madness in relationship to the emergence of queer theory, um, which is generally credited to his work in the history of sexuality. In addition, Hover offers powerful analyses of the role that sexual difference in particular plays, or shall we say fails to play, in much of Foucault's thought, showing, I think, with exceptional um, care, what might be characterized as important queer and feminist theoretic tensions, as well as convergences, an argument made um, through rethinking of various practices central to queer theory, from fisting to sodomy law in the work Are the Lips of Grave. Her current work, which will be the basis of today's talk, heads out in an entirely new direction as far as how I've summarized it so far. Undoubtedly, there are continuities which we will explore. But it considers aesthetics and art in the period that we sometimes call the Anthropocene and that Hoffer analyzes in relationship, in particular, to mass extinction. I'm not going to say much more about the content, in part because I don't know it. <laughs> But also, because I want to call attention to the fact that this lecture, um, as I suspect Professor Harper will, will talk about, is accompanied by an art installation. And I invite you, and truly hope, that you will join us in exploring that art installation after the lecture and the Q&A. I think Professor Harper is going to talk about that art installation at great length. When she does so, I suspect that she will not say what I am about to say. But I am happy to warrant it nevertheless. This lecture and the accompanying art exhibit showcase a creativity and vitality of intellect, to say nothing of an extraordinary sensitivity to affect and aesthetics that truly honors Eve Cedric's memory and scholarship and makes it my great honor to introduce Professor Lynn Hoffman. This lecture grows out of my obsession with fragments. But before I start, a few words of gratitude for the generosity with which this obsession has been received. I want to thank Gabriel Rosenberg, Jennifer Nash, and the Department of Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies for the invitation to speak here and to do something experimental with my fragments in the exhibition space. A special thanks to Gabriel again, and also to Julie Winmore for all the logistical support, to Lauren, the wonderful videographer, to Michael, Ang, and Kimberly Lamb for helping me to scope out the exhibition space here at Duke. Many thanks to Robin Wigman, who several years ago now nudged me onto a path called auto theory. I don't know if that's what this is. I'm not sure. But certainly her nudge gave me permission to play with form in ways I hadn't before. A huge thanks to my colleague, Lauren Gilmet, a philosophy professor at Elon, and the folks that Lauren recruited to help with the installation, James and Devon, two of her students. Their artistry is visible in every detail of the installation down the hall. Lauren is an artist and a thinker who inspires me in so many ways. I, I really feel that we're on this journey together. How many workshops have we done? How many have we led? Finally, inexpressible gratitude to my partner, Tamara Jones, who drove up here with me from Atlanta. She encourages me in all of these experiments. She too contributed to the installation. And she's lived among my fragments day after day, duck ducking beneath them on her way across the living room, teaching me every day how to live in this. This lecture reading installation has three components. First, substrate, what I regard as the epistemic conditions that allow my fragments to be seen and heard. Substrate as their underlying medium. Second, a reading of excerpts from my new fragment book. And third, an interactive installation of fragments down the hall that you're all invited to enjoy at your leisure during the reception following the reading. 
I want to dedicate this lecture, reading, installation to a former student, Alexa Kukopoulos. Alexa was a graduate student here at Duke in the program in literature when she passed away in April 2020. Before coming to Duke, she was a philosophy major and my student at Emory. Like Sedgwick, Alexa was a poet and an artist. She taught me how to think the way a philosopher, artist, poet does. Alexa loved all the strange inversions and chiastic reversals that pepper Michel Foucault's writing. She taught me so much. Teacher follows student. In Derrida's postcard, Socrates inverts Plato. Alexa's honors thesis on chiasmus reveled in these inverted successions, these queerings of sequence and lines of filiation, all the twists and obliquities people often miss in Foucault. Here in this lecture, in this book, and in other things I've written, I'm still thinking with Alexa. And this phrase, this envoi, this sending, keeps returning like a mantra in my head. It was first uttered by Deleuze in his course on Foucault, a year after Foucault's death. Chacun envoie sa flèche dans la cible de l'autre. Each one sends their arrow into the target of the other. Deleuze's course on Foucault was a kind of mourning, mourning as the eternal recurrence of ascending and envoi, ascending's path, crossing, crisscrossing, crossing again, untimely. Substrate. Last year I was on leave, living in an apartment at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, participating in a seminar called Climate Crisis Politics. I was writing a book that I thought would be called The Ethics of Extinction. Instead, another book appeared, These Survivals. I had gathered together fragments of art and philosophy, environmental science and experimental writing, not knowing how to write what I wanted to write. Out of sheer frustration, I started stringing lines across my living space to get a better look. The lines zigzagged, mostly at eye level, some slightly higher, some slightly lower, like geological sedimentations inside an apartment. At first, I was tentative, but slowly the zigzagging movement took over, and before I knew it, I was living inside a collage, as if the place where thought lives, the contents of my head, had been turned inside out. Mind inside out, hollowed out, shards of mind in an assemblage of pieces. When colleagues and friends stopped by or came to visit, they said it felt like entering a kaleidoscopic cave.